hopefully Camtasia doesn't crash today. Okay. Oh, really? Again? It was working earlier because I tested it. Oh, wait. I had to click on the slide. Okay. Today we're going to learn about two topics, subqueries and joints. Time permitting, we're going to learn about views. Now, essentially what you're going to learn about is, well, that this tells you, you're going to learn about inner joins, outer joins, and subqueries. And we're going to start out with, um, well, that's a repeat. Skip that. Okay, so why does she have so many slides with pointless things in it? There we go. Now we're going to get to actually what's important. I just saved like 15 minutes of talking by skipping five slides that actually have mean nothing to today's lecture. Okay, so I showed you guys how to do an inquiry uh, two weeks ago. So essentially, um, when you're doing an inquiry, you're actually doing a query where you're looking for a list of potential values. And I'll point on this side too for people on this side, maybe not. Hello? Laser there. So in, and then you have a list of values. So this treats it almost like, well, it's literally a list saying, anything that's in this list, please give me the data. Now, if we want to get the SKUs that belong to a specific department, normally you'd write it like such. So you'd grab the SKU where the SKU data is equal to, you know, the data is equal to water sport. A subquery allows you to actually do it all in one single step. So you will notice a few things in this. We basically took the last two slide, the last two slides worth of queries and we jammed them together. And what we did is we did the query that figures out the list instead of parentheses, because that, if you remember, just like in math, anything in parentheses gets executed first. And then the rest of the query up here is exactly the same as so you see this list right here? If we, this query will return that exact list. So what's happening is it'll execute the inner query on the inside, take the results, pass them to the outer query and saying, here's your list. And then it executes the outer query. Um, subqueries can be used in a bunch of different places and uh, these slides absolutely do not cover every spot, so I'm going to be demonstrating them shortly. So the logic of the subquery is described as, it has two different names. It's a nested query or a query within a query, which is the same thing as a nested query. When you, um, when you use SQL queries, that use subqueries are still the same thing as that single queries, but they actually run multiple single queries in chain. Um, and you can use as many subqueries as you want. There is a limit to what the server can do depending on your resources. If you're running on a really crappy old computer and you're querying large sets of data, those subqueries are going to start getting expensive. And here's an example of a subquery inside a subquery. So this is the exact same concept we had before, except what's happening here is on the inside, we are selecting an order number. So we're going to figure out the SKUs for where things were in that order number, and then it's going to actually pull out the buyer in the department. So essentially, we just want to know any, any orders that were placed in January 2021, get put it to the outer one. We want to know what items were in those orders, and then we just want to know who bought them. Would there be a better way to write this? Probably. But essentially, as I was saying a minute ago, on the other side, it'll run the inside one here, which is figuring out all the orders that were placed in January 2021. Then from that, it figures out the SKUs, and then it finds out the who bought it based on the SKUs on that date. It's a really gross query. Uh, but the way, basically what it would do is it would figure out the inner one, pass that to the outer one, and then pass it to the outermost one. And this one basically has everything in one place. 
So it has the aggregate, it has the group by, it has an order by, and it just does everything we just had a minute ago. So I'm going to actually do demos because you know what? The demos is way better than trying to read those slides. And did I hit the, did I launch my thing? I did. Congratulations to Dan. Okay, let's make this nice and big. Okay, I'm going to use the example from Lab 7 as my starting point. Okay, so select star from countries where names equal to Canada. I'm going to refine this a little bit because I only want the ID. So now I've got my ID for this. Here's a pro tip. You can actually run a query in parentheses without anything on the outside and it'll still work. Just so you know. Because it sees parentheses, says I gotta resolve the parentheses and there's nothing else to resolve after that, so it'll still run it. It's just there. It lets you build up your query in a sane manner. So now if I wanna say, and I'm just gonna do a little sweep on this so that it's laid out somewhat cleanly. Okay, so, what this query is going to do is it's going to grab all the airports where the country ID is in this list. You have to be careful when you use a subquery in the WHERE clause. Because as it stands right now, this will work whether I return one country or 20 countries. Because it's in, it's in a list. And I'll show you that this works. There we go. We've got airports that came back that are in Canada. If I were to go, I can also use equal. That will also work. Now here's the difference between using the equal sign and using in. The equal sign assumes a single value coming from the subquery, not two or three or four, because a country ID can only ever be equal to one value at a time. It cannot be Canada and Mexico at the same time. If you use in, or not in, or whatever, any combination of in, it'll go, well, where the country ID is in these potential values, so then at that point you could have 25 different values. It wouldn't care. So if I went to, in here and I went, where countries or name equal Mexico, you will get an error, which I am gonna bring up Right down here, which of course, this is written really, really small. But it says, SQL query must, uh, SQL query returns more than one row. Because I am trying to do an equals here. In other words, it's expecting only one value. If I were to change this so that it's in, that will work. Because it's returning two values. So it's in this list. Is there a performance um, gain to be had from using in over equals? Not really. The performance will be roughly the same. The in will be more forgiving. And that's usually how I use it. So that way, unless I know for a fact it's ever only ever going to return one value, as in select ID from countries where, you know, names equal to this. Um, where, what kind of systems do I use this in? In practice, what I will often be used for is if I don't know what the ID of a, of a value is going to be, for example, there's a list of values that are being used in a dropdown, and, you know, we have another Yugoslavia moment where the country turns into two countries, then turns into four countries, and then turns into three, and then turns into five, returns to being four. I think they're at four right now. I had a former coworker from Yugoslavia when it was still Yugoslavia. And... Um, we used to ask him every day how many countries or where his former country was. He didn't think it was very funny. Uh, we learned now that's harassment. Um, but the thing is, we never actually knew what the ID of the country might be when we were running the query because countries get added, countries get removed. So therefore, we don't actually know for a fact what the ID is going to be. So we'd always use select ID from countries where country name is equal to, you know, Montenegro. That way, you never need to know the ID of the country because you know the name of the country, you can pull it up. Same thing with order statuses or 
product listings or that kind of stuff. You, that way you don't need to hard code IDs for anything. You just use a subquery, retrieve the value that you want, and away you go. All right, so this is a standard subquery. There is two other flavors of subqueries, which are not in the slides. And I will be sending you guys a write-up on that so you have something to read. It's not long, I promise. So another thing we can do is use a subquery in the where in the from clause. Try not to sneeze, hang on. Oh, that was rough. Now, I've got the subquery in a from clause. And actually, let me just add one more thing here. ID. And I'm going to hide that so I got more screen real estate. Okay. All right, there's a reason I did this. So, right now, I am retrieving data as a subquery, but I'm doing it in part of the from clause. This is known as a virtual table. Or it's also known as a derived table. They basically mean the exact same thing. So a virtual table or a derived table, basically what happens is it executes it and then it takes the results of that query, puts it in memory. However, when you use it, you must give it an alias. So I'm going to take the alias off so you can see the error message. And the error message reads, every derived table must have its own alias. It's like the most helpful error message MySQL will ever put out. It's the only useful one it ever puts out. Um, this is one of the rare cases where like Postgres actually does a shittier job of it than this. So here's why. It runs the query, assigns the results in memory, but the SQL parser must have a table name to pull from. Therefore, when you give it an alias, the results are given a temporary name. Temporarily, this is a table called low altitude airports. Bam. So now, we can do a few other cute little things. Okay, that doesn't look any different than what I showed you guys earlier. And now I'm going to run it. So now I've got two subqueries happening side by side. The order of operation will be, it's going to do the one in the from first. Why? Because it needs data to work with. Then it'll do the one in the where. And the one in the where, as you can see, there's the country ID. That's because this derived table has these three columns. They're being passed out as is. Therefore, the country ID comes from here. And the selector shows everything we had. So at that point, this is to demonstrate that you can operate on a derived table just like a normal table. There is only one big fat caveat. You don't have any indexes. That means joins and potentially where clauses will be slower because how can you index something that doesn't exist? Right, the list of like the, the, this list of airports exists for. I know that took that ran in 0 0.016 seconds. Out of that 0 0.016 seconds, I can guarantee there's probably you know 0 0.006 seconds was actually generating the list of airports with the low altitude. And this leads me to the third kind of query. or subquery. And this is so pointless what I'm doing right now.
Okay. Well, actually, I've got to make sure it works. Yes. Okay. This leads me to a slight other discussion about subqueries. You can also do a subquery in your select section. I don't remember what that's called. It doesn't have a special name. It's just a subquery in your select section. You will notice I'm referring to the country ID that is retrieved from here to display the name of the country. What a stupid way of doing this, by the way. When I talk about joins, I'll show you a much better way to do this. This is like the dumbest thing I've written in years. But it's a great place because it shows you all three query, uh, subquery types running hand in hand, each doing their own special version of their little job. Now, what's really special about this one, though, is this. The fact that country ID is in here, this is known as a correlated subquery. A correlated subquery is a pig. Why is it a pig? Because it runs for every row returned or every row in the data set. So basically put, this subquery runs once. This subquery runs once. Um, this returned 46. This one ran 46 times. Now the query optimizer is a little smart. It's going to recognize that some of these query country IDs are uh, repeated, so it'll cache the results to make things happen faster. However, this top one is being executed 46 times because that's how correlated subqueries work. The, basically, a, the data from the query is being compared to something external to itself, so it's being correlated or, you know, related to something coming somewhere else. So in here, we're running 49 queries total, just so you know how the math works out. One, two... 48, and then we have the one on the outside for 49. It's not great. <laughs> the performance is pretty crappy. If I was doing this on a million rows, my laptop would say, bro, what are you doing? Um, you don't tend to want to use correlated subqueries like this unless you absolutely have to, um, or you're really lazy. Because Often, students understand subqueries a lot better than joins, so, and I was the same. When I left school, I was using subqueries for everything. Else. You know, it's so much easier to understand. Execute the query on the inside, pass the results to the outside, everybody's happy. And then I actually had a project that was, you know, 500,000 plus rows in it. And the queries were taking, you know, 10, 20 seconds to run. I'm like, why am I, why is this so slow? And this was before Stack Overflow, before all these nice internet tutorials. So I couldn't just go post on Stack Overflow and have a bunch of people make fun of me how stupid I am and not educated. I'm sure none of you have experienced that at all. Um, then I discovered I had to do the next topic of the lecture, which is joins. So I am going to take this copy it. And if I don't post this as part of the announcement, somebody please call me out on it. Because I will, I may forget by the time I get done today's lecture. Okay. So these are the three kinds of subqueries you'll find in the wild. Uh, the slides only ever talk about this one. This one's really important. And that's why I wanted to talk about it. I just reminded myself of something. Okay, let me change my subqueries, my setup really quick. Remember last week when I talked about how you can't do an aggregate on an aggregate? You can't nest aggregates because the math has happened once. However, there is a dirty trick we can do. get rid of this. So I'm going to grab everything from here. I knew I was forgetting something important. So right now you can see that I've got the elevations coming out. Pretty straightforward subquery, right? Now I am going to go and do this.
And I'm going to change this right now to be country ID. And that's definitely not how you spell country. And I'm going to run this. And I have an error in my syntax. Helps if you close your parentheses. All right. So right now I have a logic error in my query. It's a logic error only MySQL will ever let me do. As I did an aggregate, and I never put a group by. Oh. Okay. Better. Now we have a list of average elevations by country. So each country has an average elevation. Now let's just say we want to know not Mac. And I think I just no, I didn't break it. Okay. And this one's a really stupid query because honestly, it's always going to return the same set of values for each one. So we're going to get rid of the country. And now we can know what the min and the max average elevation is. So the lowest average elevation is zero. The maximum average elevation is 7332. So now we were able to run an aggregate on the results of an aggregate. How does this work? It runs the inner query, figures out the average. When it comes out, so I'm going to pull it out again, take off the aggregates. It returns and it just looks like a normal column. It's not an aggregate, it just says average elevation. So, right, right there, average elevation. Because this is being renamed as that, it comes out literally looking country ID and elevation. Boom, boom. Just like that. And that is how you do an aggregate on an aggregate. So if you need to know the maximum average, the minimum average, a standard deviation, which is, you know, some things people care about, you know, what is the deviation from the average for each country? You could figure that out based on this. All right. Which leads me to joins. So subqueries, people tend to understand because it's pretty easy to grasp. You're going to run a query, take the results, pass it out. You can almost picture it as in um, it's a function in Java where, you know, the function does something, it returns something to the outside, then you operate with that, which is why first-time programming students tend to understand script queries because they just think of it as a function. There is a much better way to do almost everything I just did, and that's using joins. So there is a magic operator called the join operator, and this allows you to combine two or more tables, literally n number of tables, together as a single query, and you can actually pull data for each from each of these. The data stored in each individual table, the relationship is what makes the data meaningful. That's what joins are for. There are two kinds of joins. An explicit join, which means you actually are going to be using the join operator, and then the implicit join, where you don't use the join operator. We're going to talk about the implicit one, and we're going to talk about how terrible it is and how it's out of date and nobody should ever use it. However, every time you go on the internet and you Google how to do a join in MySQL, half the time this is what's going to come up. Why? Because those answers have been on the internet for 12 years or more. The implicit join, which is not the right slide yet, was how I learned how to do joins because we didn't have the join keyword in 1995. 1996. The join keyword showed up to the party like 99 or something. Um, it was really awful learning how to doing joins. So 
There's many kinds of joins, but the most common ones are natural joins, inner joins, left and right outer joins, and then cross joins. You can use joins on tables used in materialized views because they all act like tables. You can mix and match join types in a single query because that's cool. Um, so I'm going to start with the natural join. The natural join is the lazy man's join. It creates a join between two tables based on common field names. So the query optimizer and the parser will look at the table structure of all the tables in the join and say, oh, this one's got a column called person ID, that one's got a column person ID. I'm going to be smart, that's how we're going to join. If there is no column or common column names, it turns into a Cartesian join, which is, means it joins every row to every other row. The easiest way to picture a Cartesian join is picture a deck of cards. You have four suites and the number cards, right? One through king, or ace through king. And essentially what a Cartesian join will do, will do hearts one, hearts two, hearts three, spades one, spades two, spades three, until you have literally a complete ma uh, matrix of every combination of every value. Okay, so let me warn you about one thing. Right now you're assuming the database is designed correctly. You're assuming that the, as the query optimizer is going to actually know what you want. Therefore, you're assuming the results are correct. What was the word I used in all three statements? Should you always assume? Or should you never assume? Never assume. Ever. Why? Because the computer is going to make a fool of you. Um, one of the perks of learning Java, it doesn't let you assume anything. Ever. When you learn other programming languages that are a lot more forgiving, um, like Python or PHP or JavaScript, you tend, to make a, you tend to make a lot of assumptions and you hope you got it right. So what happens with the natural join is it literally will grab the matching columns from two tables. Maybe that's not even what you want to join on. Maybe that's not even right. What happens if you've got three tables, one ta uh, two of the tables that are both childs of the first one, and they have a matching column name. Therefore, it's actually going to join the child tables to each other instead of joining it to the parent table because it says these ones match because you assumed that's how it assumed that's what you wanted, not you assumed, it assumed. And which brings us to the cross join, which is also what I just described. Uh, this is a uh, just literally another way of writing this. So table one, natural join, table two. This is the common delimited approach. This is known as an implicit join. Again, what does it do? It assumes how you want to connect the stuff. It will just give you a big pile. Um, and at least there's one good thing on this slide. This is a logical and database work because we actually want things that actually interconnect properly. Therefore, we should never assume that this is going to work. Why they ever allowed this, I have no idea. Somebody thought it was a great idea, but it wasn't. And here's an example. Select employee ID, full name, department ID, department name. With this cross join, it will literally give me each employee will belong to every department and every department will have every employee. That's what the cross join is going to do. It's not a very useful thing unless you're trying to build a matrix. So here is an implicit join. And this actually comes from your handy dandy textbook. Now, if you're going to do an implicit join, which you go a select star from the common delimited list, where, and then in the where clause, you're telling it how the tables are related to each other. This is how joins were done in the 90s and before the 90s. There is some 
performance issues with this. What it will do is it will retrieve all the rows from retail order, all the rows from order item, and then filter after it's pulled all the rows. It's not reducing the pull from the beginning. It is literally saying, I'll use the example in here. I want to know student, country of origin. But instead of saying, hey, let's just put on a list of countries of origin and then get people to move to the right piles, I'm going to go, I'm going to grab everybody in this room. I'm going to grab all the potential countries of origin in this room. And then I'm going to start going, oh, student, are you in this country or this country or this country or this country or this country? Student number two, am I in country this, this, this? You can see how it would constantly overdo it. So implicit joins is how it used to be done because we didn't have the join operator. And it works. You can use it to this day. No problem. It'll work. It has to because it's part of the SQL standard. Yes? It will just do a cross join of all the values from both tables. So, for example, it's not going to, let's say there's four rows in each table, it's not going to give you uh, eight rows, it'll give you four times four rows. Four to the power of four, actually. Rows. It's going to be pretty terrible. Um, so, yeah, don't use implicit joins because, again, you're just assuming it's going to work. Um, and this is just a zoomed up version of what we were just talking about. Um, there is one catch. When a field name is the same in both tables, you need to add the field, the table name to it. So for example, in this case, see the order number is here and the order number is there. So you have to prefix it. So these are called table prefixes. Um, if you don't have the table prefix, you will get an interesting error message. It's going to be called something, something is ambiguous. So in this case, if we didn't include this, it would say the order number is ambiguous, as in, I don't know what order number you're talking about. Please tell me what order number you're referring to. And then it'll, it'll go. But honestly, if you wrote order number is equal to order number in the where, it's pretty gross. Anyways, even you won't know which order number you're referring to. So yes, on this slide, this is the big takeaway is this one. But that is a, you know, literally an implicit join, select star from this, comma, dot, where, et cetera. And it'll just give you all the columns from both tables. And I will demonstrate that in, uh, it's, it's more the same because you can use the order by. Yeah. All right. Let me go show you guys this instead. Select star from airports, comma, country countries where airports dot country underscore ID is equal to countries dot ID. And now it's retrieving all the columns from both tables. And you can see right here where you suddenly have the column called ID in here twice. That could be a, a source of ambiguity, and I'll show you guys what that looks like in a moment. So let's say I just wanted to have, no, that's not what I asked you to do. ID, comma, name, and I'm going to run this. Now we get our happy little error message, which the people at the back cannot read. I know. But it says, column ID in field list is ambiguous. It's saying, I don't know what ID you're talking about. So I'm going to put in, and now I'm going to run it again. Now it's going to say the name is ambiguous because the name happens to exist in both column, in both tables. And now I'm going to get clever and I'm going to go, and I'm going to add the country name on here. And now we have the ID of the airport the name of the airport, and the name of the country. Again, this is using an implicit join. It is not the most performant way of doing this. It is the old way of doing this. 
And I got people that are typing like mad, so I'm going to just wait till I stop here in keystrokes. Okay, that looks like the majority. All right, so now we're going to talk about the explicit way of doing this, where you are actually going to use. Um, wait a minute, what's this talk about? Oh, that's such a stupid phrase. Okay, so this is an equijoin. In other words, it's saying that the country ID is equal to the ID of the country. It's a join where the values are equal. Thus, it's an equijoin. So basically what happens is it'll return all the results where the values on both sides match, which is the point of a join. And you can process as many joins as you want. And by the end, I will demonstrate joining almost every table in this database in one go. And this is just another equijoin. So we're going to, I already, dem already demonstrated this. Okay. So comparing a subquery to a join is an SQL subquery and a join both process multiple tables. We've demonstrated that. A subquery can be retrieved data from the top table, which kind of sounds funny because you can, you can nest subqueries, but basically each subquery returns values to its parent query, which at that point is its top query, which becomes the next top query until you get to the outside most. Um, an SQL join, on the other hand, can retrieve data from any of the tables involved, whereas the subquery can only ever, you can only ever retrieve data from the outermost query with a subquery. With the join, you can pull from any of the tables, which is significantly more useful. So now we're going to talk about the join syntax, which is, you know, the actual useful part of today's lecture. Um, I can guarantee there is no implicit joins on the exam. How do I know? Because I dropped off the exam for printing just before this class. Okay? So I was talking about it because I have to talk about it. It's not on the exam. This, going forwards, is going to be on the exam. The first part about subqueries will be on the exam. The part about implicit joins, which is a terrible way of doing things, will not be in the exam because I want you to forget about it. Because it is the wrong way of doing it. If you go get a job in the wild and you actually give an implicit join and you're, the person is doing the pull request on your code, looks at them, they'll go, what the heck is wrong with you? Use a join. Okay, so SQL join is used to separate the tables in the from clause. So before, we you know I had table one comma table two. We, there's actually a magic set of keywords you can shove between those. So you don't have to include stuff in the where clause. And the word on is basically saying you're going to join on this table. The where clause is no longer required because part of the join syntax includes the point of commonality, basically the equi, uh, the equi part. Um, and as the last item says, the explicit SQL join on syntax currently consider the proper right way to write SQL join operations. Uh, the older ones consider archaic, but it still works. Um, some of these joins that we're going to show you guys had special syntax on Oracle because Oracle didn't have joins for a long time, so we had to do this really stupid syntax for the same thing. Okay. Here's the syntax of a, um, a straight up join. I don't like the way they wrote that, but this is a, f a full join, also known as an inner join. You'll notice that the word inner doesn't appear anywhere in the query. That's because the word inner is optional, as is the word for the outer joins. The word outer is optional. So what this does, this query does the exact same thing the common delimited one did, except what it does do is before it operates the where clause, which this doesn't have the where clause, it'll actually do the pull from this, 
It'll do the join and filter immediately before you get to the where. That means what's coming out is going to be smaller. The mem there's less memory being used. It's optimized. It'll run better because the syntax allows for it. So now I'm going to rewrite this. like such. And I'm going to do a little broom to, you know, make it a little more legible. I don't like the way it wrote that. There. This is easier to read. Okay, so here's what the syntax is doing. It's pulling the call, the call names, because that's nothing new, from airports. It's joining countries and then on this. So the syntax, and I'll point for these guys on this side too, so airports join countries on that. So the, basically what it's saying is you want everything from airports, you want to connect countries. On means based on this clause. That's what the on stands for. So join on this clause. You can actually have multiple clauses in here. I can actually get really fancy and put stuff that you normally have in the where and actually have it as part of the join so that I can reduce the data set further before anything gets to the where. The hardest part of remembering this syntax is the fact that the word join is here, the word on is there, and you have to have a clause. Once you remember this structure, it's all gravy. And there is one other um, little thing about it. I'm going to run it and explain to you guys what this is doing in just a second. Whew, that took a little longer. Okay. I'm pulling from airports. I'm connecting countries. I'm also connecting routes to the airport. And routes has two foreign keys, destination and source airport ID. So, you know, when you get on a plane, you take off from a source airport and you land at a destination airport. The destination airport ID is where you landed. Uh, actually, what's cool about this database is that there's a few routes that don't have destinations. Why? Because you take off and land at the same airport. They're, pl they're pleasure trips. You know, if you take a lap around the city, land again, give somebody $1,000 for that 20 minutes. And then I am joining the airlines based on the, you know, the airline ID and the routes. And then I'm pulling out the airport ID, the name of the airport, the country, and the airline. Now, when this is running, there's a few basic rules. The joins happen left to right. What does that mean by left to right? It means that it'll pull from airports, then join countries, then join routes, then join airlines. It's not going to go join the airlines and then grab the airports. It literally goes from first to last, also known as left to right, which will become important in a moment when I start talking about left and right joins. The other thing you have to know about joins is you cannot join a table that has not already been included before it in the left to right. Okay? So, for example... I'm going to take my airlines right here, and this is where my skills are going to make a liar out of me. So I put airlines before routes. However, airlines joins to routes. Let's hope it actually, oh, thank goodness. It actually worked the way I expected it to. The error message is absolutely useless. Uh, unknown column, route airline ID, 
in the on clause. Now the reason for that is because roots is being joined in after. So therefore the query optimizer does not know where this is coming from yet. So you cannot join a table to another table unless the, the table you're connecting to was there before. So there's an order of operations in this. And so if I were to take it and put it back where it was, this one works. Why? Because roots is already in the list of available tables above it. When I had it, when I had this guy living up here, roots was happening after the fact. Therefore, the query optimizer didn't know where to get it from. Does that kind of make sense? It's clear as mud. People's brains are melting out of their ears. Usually, that's what it's like during the discussion about joins. Uh, the only real way to learn, understand joins is to do joins, which is also known as lab nine. <laughs> and I, I start you off easy with a single join, and then by the end, you're going to be angry at Dan. But that's okay, because pain equals learning. Um, that's how humans learn, is pain. So these are known as inner joins. An inner join means that this, the values in this table must exist in this table. So both of these values must exist. And as I said earlier, I can actually add in some fancy stuff in here where I can go At this point I can do the join and actually start filtering the list of airports before I even hit the where clause. Should you do this? Depends where you work. Some shops will let you do this because it actually will speed up the query somewhat. Because it's going to filter. What it's going to do is it's going to grab airports, join the countries on this and say, oh yeah, by the way, I don't also don't want to include airports that have this. And then it'll do the rest of the joins. Therefore, it's reducing how much is being pulled back with every one. So this is query optimization where would I, well, we'd actually notice a speed difference if I do this. Okay, so that ran in 0 0.07 seconds. And I'm going to slap it in a where down here. Oh, hold on. And it actually ran in zero time because I ran the exact same query. Because in the end, the optimizer determined that it was, I was asking for the same question, so it didn't even try to run it. So let's change that number to, to something else so that it doesn't. Okay, so apparently it's got the data cached well enough now that it doesn't even need to think about what I'm asking. So, so much for trying to make that point. So those are standard joins or inner joins. And this is another example of what I just did. I just like doing the examples on screen because you can see it working. Um, I'm going to skip on this one. And this one is just showing you, you can do order buys, you can add stuff in the where clause. These are just continuations of what I just demonstrated. And on three or more tables, well, I just showed you guys four. So, you know. But these are good examples, you know, for reference when you're studying. That'll be that. Okay. Why am I showing three or more and then three or more? Okay. The logic of the join. So, student unlocker. In here, you can see that it's matching up based on the locker ID, the foreign key, and the primary key match up, and that's literally how it does the join. It's not that complicated. It just looks complicated. When you do a, a, an inner join and you're using an equal sign, it's literally going to say, give me everything in this table where the value in this column is equal to something in this table here. And now we have an equal list of columns to pull from because things match up. So what it'll do is actually like slides the data back and forth so things are lined up. All right, so that was the inner join. That's what I finished demonstrating. Essentially, 
And man, I hate when the people use Venn diagrams for this. Um, I have a better diagram for you towards the end that I'm going to pull off my hard drive and then post to Brightspace. So essentially when you do an inner join, it grabs records where the values overlap. So you've got two sets of data, it'll return where the exact overlap is. It's not that much past what I just demonstrated. So the pet inner join, again, inner join syntax again for three tables, why? Okay, left outer joins, man, I could cut the slide deck in half. So left outer join, this is the other kind of join. There's left and right. These are kind of cool. Um, I really wish I had a proper data set ready for you guys to demonstrate. But these are not used very often. So remember earlier when I was talking about how the tables are joined from left to right? So the first one is the first to the left, the next one is to the right, the next one's to the right, the next one's to the right. So everything above wherever one you're in is to the left. So when you're doing a left join or a left outer join and a right outer join, it'll give me everything from the leftmost table and any potential matches from the rightmost table. The, the order is important in this because it'll always use the one to the left first, so if you're doing a left outer join. And the syntax looks like this. So it's going to select the student primary key, the student name, the locker, foreign key, the locker, primary key, and the locker type from student left outer join locker on student locker, the foreign keys, order by student ID. So what it will return, and I hope they actually have data here. No, of course not. It'll return everything from student and any matches from locker. So for example, if I want to pull out the list of students and lockers, and I still want to know the students that don't have lockers yet, and how many of you here don't have a locker? Yeah, most of you. So if, if for, a, for example, I do this query, I would go, pretending I'm using the students in this room, everybody who had their hand up would return nulls for the locker primary key and the locker type. Everybody else, I'd get values for the locker information. Um, let me just go double check something in the database really quick, because I know for a fact I think that's right. Yes, I can demonstrate this. Fantastic. Okay. Select star from airports. Left join. By the word, by the way, the word outer is optional. Roots on airports dot id is equal to destination airport id and I'm going to run this. Okay. Fantastic. We got all kinds of data. Now return 75,000 rows. At the end you will see that all the airports are null. These are the routes that don't actually have a destination um, well literally yeah it doesn't have a destination on the route um, so what this means is it's pulling in everything from routes where it matches up and if it doesn't find matches it returns nulls for everything now what is this handy for this kinds of queries Let's pretend we're Amazon today. And Amazon has a gajillion products in their warehouse. And you want to know which products have not moved off the shelf. So you go select everything from orders, left join products, and suddenly you'll have a list of nulls that come out. And there's ways of, you know, you can flip it so you get the products that don't show up 
by doing the left, playing with the left joint and the right joint. So in this case, we know for a fact that we have airports that have no destination route. And that's how it behaves. So if we keep scrolling up, eventually I'll hit the spot where it's... Oh, oh, there we go. So you can see here a mix match where some of the data is there, some of the data is not because it didn't find a destination. And so we have nothing that comes back or we could have done it with the airline also. Apparently there's some routes that don't actually have airlines on them anymore because the routes, you know, the airlines are gone or they never had an airline or it's a route run by a private carrier. So that's how a left join works. And if I wanted to make this into a right join, I could just switch the word airports and routes and just use right join. It would be, right join, left join do the exact same thing. It just, instead of grabbing from the left, it grabs from the right. And if I wanted to demonstrate that, I'll actually show you really quick. And now what's happening is it's giving me the list of all the routes and I'm getting nulls for the airports, right? So that's still a left join. If I were to flip it so that we have the exact same results as before, I could go right join and we will get the route information first and then we'll have our nulls down here. So there's the left and the right join. Essentially, it just grabs whatever's from the right, join whatever to the left, give me anything from the left, because it's asking for a right join. So give me everything from the right as opposed to the left. Left join gives me everything from the left, and if it finds anything to the right. If it finds nothing, it returns nulls. So this is a good way to find out if uh, people's email addresses are in a mailing list, what products have never been sold, um, maybe you want to find out what users have never logged into a system. Let's say you have a system where every time you log in, it puts a record of last time you logged in. And uh, yeah, that's actually how I found out one of our sales managers at my day job was not actually ever logging into the CRM. They asked me, when was the last time you logged into the CRM? This guy's in charge of all the sales guys. I ran the query. He would never logged into it. How can you do your job if you're not using the tools? That'd be like saying a programmer has, is using Notepad to write Java code. Yes, you can do it. Is it going to be efficient? No. All right, so that's left and right joins. And that's the right outer join. The slide talks about what I just uh, demonstrated. And this one here is student grab the lockers. So what it'll do is it'll give me all the lockers and the students if there's a student assigned to it. So that'd be, you know, earlier I asked how many people in here have a locker. So I could do, give me all the students and show me their lockers if they have it. This could be the other way around. Show me all the lockers and give me the name of the student if it's assigned to someone. So it gives you both lists by just changing from left to right. All right. So the last item in this list is set theory. You guys should know about sets and math. Did you guys learn about sets in your math courses? <sighs> okay, depending what country and what math courses you took, and depending what you did in high school and how long high school was ago, because I never took sets when I went through math in high school. That was part of uh, grade 13 math, and I didn't take any grade 13 maths. So we used to have a grade 13 in Ontario. <sighs> Oof, that gives me nightmares thinking about grade 13. Um, so there is three special sets of set operators. And essentially, which is why I said I hate when they use Venn diagrams for joins, because really Venn diagrams are used for sets. So how many of you guys learned about Venn diagrams very little, but I mean, usually they cover, they cover it in math class in like 20 minutes. You know, these are all the people, these are cats, these are the people that are happy. 
right, where the circles overlap. As you can tell, I'm a cat person. And if you can't tell by the amount of cat hair I'm usually wearing. Actually, I came up pretty good today. So basically, set operation is you are going to do uh, the operation of two sets and find the things that overlap between them. And there are three operators available to database people. And essentially, the three are, is this. There is a union, an intersect, and a um, complement. And the union basically takes the entirety of both and only gives you the unique from one, all the values from one, and anything it finds in two. That isn't already in one. So that's a union. So everything from here plus anything in this area here is included. An intersect says, just give me the things where they're the same. A complement, which, get ready, it's not called a complement in SQL, just, just so you know. It gives you everything in set A that is not in set B. So essentially it excludes everything in set B, so you get everything from set A. And our three operators, I know that Sandra used one of my slides for this. Can you tell? There's not a lot of words. Um, so when you are using a set operator between two tables, the number of columns being returned must be the same. So if you are pulling two columns from query one, two columns from query two, you can run it as a set. If you cannot compare two columns to three columns. Why? Because then they're not equivalent sets. Right? We can go back to you know people and cats and you could do another circle on people and dogs. They're equivalent, one superior. You know, not a few people who didn't get that one. But anyway, so but there were you comparing similar sets, right? Person, dog, person, cat. When you are running sets, they must have the same number of columns, otherwise it's not going to work. And in most database systems, and this is where I'm putting in the word most, because MySQL is special that way, they must also have the same data types. You cannot compare an integer to a, car, to a var car. Why? Because a number is not a character. Come on, is Z a number? Say Z is not a number. Yeah, there's an ASCII number, but it's not a number. It's a character. It's not a number. Say Z, so you can't go say Z plus five equals something. That's not how the math works. Three plus five is a number. C plus something else is a word. You can compare letters, you can compare numbers, but for set operations, except in MySQL, because MySQL is stupid. You, you must have the same data types for each of the columns. So if you have a column, if you have a column like this where one set is 1A and the other set is B, B, you won't be able to compare them because they're not, they don't contain the same kind of data. If this was 2B, then we can compare the two sets because we have the same number of columns and we have the same kind of data in each of the columns. Yes, I could cast it, and now everything's a string, which is basically what MySQL does. Okay. Now, there are three operators. Union, intersect, which we saw on the previous slide, and we have the word accept. Unless you're working on Oracle, then it's called minus. Set A minus set B. It's the same thing as saying set A except anything you find in set B. It's the same idea. Except is the complement. Intersect is where things match up. Union is everything from A plus anything new from B. And this is how you would write a union. 
You write a query with the same number of columns. With three columns, you do a union. Write a second query with the same number of columns. It will run query number one, then run query number two, take the results from two, compare them to one. It'll give you everything from one plus anything new it finds in two. That's what union does. And if I were to turn around and do an intersect, if you look at the queries, the only difference is the word intersect is appearing. And I'm, in a minute, I'm going to shit on MySQL again. So same exact idea, the two queries are there. And accept is written the exact same way. You just change the magic keyword. OK. And here's the three examples on one slide. Fantastic. This is also one of my slides. You can tell. Now, this is where I'm going to shit on MySQL. Every other database on Earth supports all three. OK? MySQL supports union. Only union. You can only do union with MySQL. It is too stupid to understand how to do an intersect or an accept. Which, way back in the day, was one of the reasons why, when I was still in charge of this course, we'd moved away from MySQL, because I couldn't get students to practice intersect or accept. MySQL has union and union only. Congratulations. That's the one you need to know. That's why you don't actually have a lab on this topic. Because I, what's the point of getting you to do 30%, 33% of the work to see the difference? Um, so MySQL has union, does not have intersect or accept. It's just the way the cookie crumbles. Where are these examples from? I wrote them. Well, I, I, this was uh, originally written for Postgres. So this one would work in Postgres. It would work in Microsoft SQL Server. Two of the three, in actual fact, there's a typo. This should say intersect, not union. In Postgres, uh, this one would say minus instead of accept. Yeah, I mean, that's Oracle, I mean. Postgres uses accept. Microsoft SQL Server uses accept. Oracle uses minus, and I think DB2 uses minus. So depending on what database engine you're using, the syntax might be slightly different on the complement. OK, so that was the last slide for this. And I'm on perfect time to dive into part of next week's topic so that I can give you guys absolutely everything you need Actually, you know what? It'll be faster if I go this way. I just don't remember the structure of the slide deck, so I just got to take a quick look. Oh, good. Fantastic. The, the important part's the first part. For you, for the assignment at least. Okay. All right. One, two, three, because the first three slides are useless. Why do we need to have the picture of the database in every slide? Yes, and it's from Google. All right. So, the, net, the last topic is views and indexes, uh, but views is the important one. I'm trying to remember if I made you guys do indexes for the assignment or not. Does anybody, anybody remember seeing the word index on the assignment? Index, fantastic. Okay, so I will talk about indexes. Okay, I was just trying to decide where I was stopping in the slide deck. It's been a while since I read the whole assignment through. That's what I was asking. At least I know some people read it to the end. And uh, all right, so a view is a query that has been given a name and the structure of the query is stored in the database. My database prof from when I took database back in the day, 1995, 1996, 
will get very, would get very angry with me for the next words I'm about to utter. A view is like a bookmark. It's not. But it's like a bookmark in, um, in your web browser. Because, you know, you, you go to a web page with a really long URL and you create a bookmark. The next time you want to go there, you don't type in the big long URL. You just go, you know, favorites, bup, and away it goes. A view is roughly the same idea. You're going to create a query that's complicated, and then you are going to um, give it a name. The structure is saved in the database, and that is it. So every single time you call forth the view, it runs that query. The view allows you to hide the underlying structure and allows you to pull out a subset or summary of the data from more than one or more tables. So you can take, you know, your complicated joins that I did earlier and give it a name and you don't ever need to write that complicated join again. Um, complex queries that need to be executed frequently are often saved as a view just for easier access. Sometimes you need to change what the views pull, but you don't want to change your database application. That, so you'll create the data, database application so it talks to the view, and then you can update the structure of the view later so that you don't have to change the application. Let me word it like this. If you need to update in one place, the database, or you need to update you know, 10,000 deployed applications, which one do you think will happen faster? Updating the structure in the database because everybody gets it instantly. Okay, the syntax is create or replace view, give it a name as, and you have your select statement. Allow me to demonstrate. Actually, let me go see how many slides are going to talk about this first. Um, okay, so or earlier on this one here, it said it showed or replace, and or replace is in square brackets, which means it's optional. It means it's, you're going to create the view, and if it already exists, you're going to replace it with whatever you just defined. So that means you're updating the structure of the view. There is a catch. It must have the same number of columns. So if you're changing a view, it must return the same structure. As in, if it originally returned three columns, after you update the view, it must still return three columns. If it returns four or two, you're going to get an error. So you have to drop and recreate the view instead. So my recommendation especially with MySQL, because I've had MySQL not do the or replace for me, and I never figured out why, is don't ever use or replace, drop it and recreate it. Why? Because at least you know for a fact that it's going to take whatever you're trying to feed it and not either give you an error or fail silently. Because that's what it had, did to me, is this, I was doing create or replace and the views weren't changing. I couldn't figure out why. And eventually I got tired of it and I dropped the view and just created the view and it worked. So it was determining that yeah, you know what? We didn't change this enough, so we're just going to keep what was here before because it's too much work to actually update. MySQL. The name of the view is what it's supposed to be called, and then, you know, the where conditions is, you know, what to be included. A simple example is, as such, create view doctor as select name of hospital, comma doctor from hospital. So instead of having to write select name of hospital comma doctor from hospital, you could just go select star from doctor. And it would give you the doctor and what hospital they work at. I'm going to do views with our flight DB so that you guys have, you know, examples of that. And it comes back to select star from hospital, which I just discussed. Okay. I'm going to run... Oh, they actually, did they actually misname that? No, they wouldn't, they wouldn't get those slides wrong, would they? Yeah, they got it wrong. The concept's right, the example's wrong. Let me just show you guys myself. Okay, let's go with, uh, oh, hang on, let's go back to our really stupid query we wrote earlier. Hold on. Hang on, we're almost there. Oh, shoot. Oh, uh, no. Oh, I just lost my... Really? Uh, somewhere. Oh, right, that's the stupid MySQL. 
What's the redo command? Control Y. Who the heck does Control Y? Shift Control Z. Not Word. Not PowerPoint. I spend my days in it. I right, guess I'm not going to do the super stupid query. Uh, oh. In actual fact, you know what's really special? I bet if I did this, I'd have it. No. If I did this, no, don't have that one either. I knew I kept it. There we go. Here's our happy, stupid query that we, I ran earlier, right? The one with like three different sub, sub queries. So I can create a view as such. Create view stupid query as, now I'm going to run it, I get no results back because I'm not querying right now, I'm actually creating a new database object. So now I can go select star from st stupid query and it's not stupid plus query, it's stupid query, ta-da. So instead of this big, fat, long query, I've got a nice, short little query. And now I could run aggregates against this too, which is another way of doing an aggregate on an aggregate. Create your view, run your aggregates against it. Literally, that's all there is to views. There's, there's more to it than that, but this is all, that's the basics of it. You have a statement. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I tend to use queries like this for um, data warehousing. So we run complex, you know, we run sales, we need to know, you know, seven days, 30 days, 90 days, you know, 365 days. And we have complex queries that does the math based on those ranges of time. And then we'll create a view so that in the application code, we don't need to go write this big long select statement, we're gonna go select from, select star, star from nine, last 90, 90 days sales. And that way it returns the same structure all the time, but the time window is slowly moving because we wrote the query so the time window moves. But we don't need to embed that logic in our code because a database is taking care of it for us. Now, okay, back to my PowerPoint. Um, you can also use alter view. It has the same limitations as replace. So it does the exact same thing as create or replace, or you can do alter. Not all database servers support or replace. Not all database support servers support alter. Check your documentation or just try it. If it blows up, you know it doesn't support it. It's a pretty, pretty quick way of doing it. Um, now this is just altering a view, doctor view. If you want to get rid of a view, it's drop view. You can put in if exists. That means that if you drop it and it doesn't exist, it won't give you an error. So drop it if it exists. If it doesn't exist, pretend it dropped anyways. And you give it the name of the view, and it's gone. So when I said that's all there is to views, that's the basics of creating views. There's two kinds of views. So far, everything I've shown you is known as a dynamic view. So it's like a bookmark in your web browser. You click on it, you run the query, it executes it right away and shows you the freshest version of everything. The other kind is called the materialized view. The materially, materialized views occur for data warehousing. So what does data warehousing mean? For large corporations where they have insane amount of data happening on, the, on a regular basis. They don't want the sales guys querying the main database all the time. Why? Because, you know, it could be a really expensive process to be doing. Um, a while back, during one of my previous employments, 
we were writing a reporting engine for a wine distributor. So what they did is they brought the wine into Canada, sold it to different liquor agencies and wine stores and corner stores, depending on which part of the country you're in. And then we would actually collect all the data coming from these sales from the different liquor agencies so that they could run reports to find out which wine is selling well, you know, what is the average selling price of the wine in different jurisdictions, that kind of thing. Whenever we imported the data from the SAQ, so for those of you that don't know, the SAQ is the Liquor Commission in Quebec. And for once, Quebec does it right. We could pull the data daily from them. Ontario, we could only get data once a week. Manitoba, once every two weeks. Quebec, we could get daily data. And we got a lot of data. Man, do they ever sell a lot of liquor in Quebec. And the data didn't include just wine, it included beer, it included hard liquor, it included liqueurs, it included everything. Same amounts of data, like we're talking close to 75 to 100,000 rows of data a day. We'd be using something called a materialized view, so we take this data, summarize it, and update the materialized view with it, so that when the sales rep would run the reports, it wasn't querying 10 million rows of data, it was querying the summary. So the dynamic view, which I just finished discussing before, it's known as a virtual table. Uh, some people will call it a drive table. Do you notice these words have look very similar to when you're using a subquery in the from clause? Because they basically do the exact same thing. It takes up no room on the hard drive. Oh, by the way, this slide's kind of important for the exam. Um, <laughs> that's terrible, giving, dropping hints like that. Um, it does not occupy room on the hard drive other than the, you know, 1K of space for the query. Just like when you have a bookmark for a website, you don't have the entire website in your computer, you have the bookmark. When you call the, the view, it's executed immediately, it retrieves all the most recent data, it allows you to simplify. The, any data changing in the underlying tables behind the view will be visible immediately, it's always up to date, it's always fresh, which means if it's a really expensive query, it's going to be an expensive query to run every single time you pull from it. And I don't know whether there's a job view one here. Okay, materialized views. The difference between a dynamic view and a materialized view is that a materialized view is persistent. You create the view, it grabs a snapshot of the data and slaps it on the hard drive. So that the next time you run that materialized view, you go select start from stupid query, instead of querying all the tables, it'll actually go look at an object called stupid query. So that data is being stored on the disk and it will obviously take up space. And instead of running the underlying query, it goes and looks at the data you pulled. If going back to our bookmark example, there used to be a feature in old web browsers, which you don't really see very much anymore, where you had the option to store a page. So you'd create a bookmark, but you could create a special bookmark that it would not just create the bookmark, it would literally scrape the page so that the next time you click on the bookmark, it would pull up the page exactly as you saw it. It would cache the HTML, the images, the JavaScript, all that fun stuff. It would keep a copy on your hard drive of that page. This was a really popular feature back in the day when things on the internet were changing on a daily basis. Imagine you could go to you know, Instagram and just say, I want to bookmark this page, but I actually want you to scrape it so I see it. Next time I use this bookmark, I see this exact view of Instagram. Because you know you're never going to find that picture a second time. That's what a materialized view does. Is it takes the results of your query, stores it as is on, this, on the disk, and it's static. It does not change after that. And what is the difference between create view and create materialized view? Well, actually, literally, the word materialized. So if I were to take my, my stupid view that I had over here earlier, uh, no, not this, here, okay. Scroll back up, and I go, drop view stupid query, and I turned it into a materialized view.
And is this going to work? Pardon? Of course not. It's supposed to. But apparently it's not going to today. So that's amazing. Um, there you go. You don't even need to worry about learning it. Um, I'm going to finish talking about it because we use it in everywhere else. So apparently SQL, I know for a fact it did support it for a while. So I guess they decided it wasn't valid enough for, or maybe it's the version of MySQL I've got running. Yeah, it's at 8.1. I'm running 8.0. This is the same one you guys are running. 8.1 has materialized views, supposedly. All right, so the syntax is create materialized view. And if you want to drop it, drop materialized view. You got to tell it's a materialized view, otherwise it doesn't know what to do with it. And going forward, you can just select from it like you always would. Now, there's two differences though. A materialized view, when you first create it, creates a snapshot of the data, and that is static. That means it will never change. So if you're doing daily sales totals, example, let's use Amazon as our example, where if you're a vendor on Amazon, you actually have dashboards you can go to and it shows you the previous day's sales. When you go pull that up to view your previous day's sales, I guarantee you they're not querying the full Amazon sales database. Uh, they're probably querying a materialized view of some sort on your shard of the data now, what happens is, two days from now, you want to see yesterday's sales data. What happens is, the materialized view will not update automatically every day. It doesn't happen every day. Because once you run it, it's created statically. So, the dynamic view will show you the data, but it's going to be slow. The materialized view will be fast, but it's not up to date. So, what do you do? There's something called refresh. So essentially a materialized view will exist, the data will be there, but it may be inconsistent with what's in the live database because some records may be added, some records may be deleted, but the materialized view only remembers what it saw when you created it. So they've created a function in it called refresh. So you go refresh materialized view, and give it a name. What it will do is it'll look at the SQL query, like in my case it would be that stupid query, it would run it again, truncate the data it has on disk, <coughs> and update it with what's now fresh. So for, back to my Amazon example, odds are at some point around midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., they've got a batch job that runs at night and refreshes all the materialized views for each of the sales reps. So that way they get up-to-date data, and it runs. <coughs> And this example is showing that if you deleted a row, it would still be in the materialized view, but it wouldn't be in the live data until you refresh it. So when you refresh the view, you get the most up-to-date data. Man, she puts a lot of slides talking about the same thing. And the last item we need to talk about is indexes, and this one's going to be really quick. Um, Dan, we're still under time which is good. So a lot of queries only need a little bit of data from the database. And if you were going to search the entire database, it could be really inefficient. So for example, select star from users where name is equal to Dan. And there is no indexes in there yet. So what it'll do is go, user one is the name equal to Dan. User two is the name equal to Dan. User three is the name equal to Dan. That's known as a table scan. So it starts with the first row, goes row by row by row, one after another, comparing what is in your where clause. Fine, you got 100 rows, the computer's going to do that so fast it doesn't need to think. Now we got 10 million rows. It might take a little longer. And the best part is you have an or clause, so you're going to go, is the name equal to Dan? Is the name equal to Dan? Is the name equal to Dan? Or is the name equal to, you know, Pablo? Is the name equal to Pablo? Is the name equal to Pablo? Yeah. So, somebody created a concept called indexes. So, 
You know how in textbooks, you can open the back, and there's an index, you try to find a topic, it tells you to go to this page? Computer index, database indexes basically do the same thing. What it does is it doesn't go after, like literally, it tells it where it is in the table. So there's like a magic internal address that you can't see. But it says, oh, all the DANs are located in this spot. So then you only need to scan from record 55 to 73 instead of, you know, 1 million. And then it scans through that. So you can picture an index a bit like a librarian. Um, fewer and fewer people go to libraries. But for those of us that have been to libraries, and over the years this hasn't changed very much, you go and use their computer to try to find a book. How many of you have successfully found what you were looking for by using the computer? How often? Every single time or about 50-50 crapshoot? Sure, we can use chapters in Indigo with the same thing. Except that chapters in Indigo, they don't have librarians. They just have, you know, drones that don't actually know what they have on the floor. Yes. So, back to my library example. You have, you search the computer, you can't find the book. So what the next step you do is you march your butt over to the desk and you ask the librarian, I'm trying to find books on this topic. And if there are any, if, I don't know if librarians nowadays are like they were when I was a kid, or even when my kids were young, they go, oh yeah, you want to go to, you want to go look for books starting in 91925 point something? Those are going to be the books you want. Never even looked up from her keyboard, right? Because in her mind, she knows where all the books are, or if they knew. Um, smaller libraries, the big libraries, like the Ottawa Library, not so much, but you know, little school libraries, librarians are pretty good for that. They basically are your index. Like they know, based on a topic, where things are. Computer indexes do something similar based on things that are indexed, it knows how to quickly find them in the tables. So an index is a hidden structure that helps find where records are in the database table. Primary keys are always indexed. So you know when you create a table and you define a key, a, a field as a primary key, that gets indexed instantly. Why? Because odds are you're gonna be retrieving data using indexes, uh, using the primary key, therefore, Makes sense to index it. Other fields, combination of fields can be indexed. Those are known as secondary indexes. They can be unique or non-unique. And the most common type of index is known as a B plus tree. And it allows for four levels deep, but it can go out hundreds of columns wide. And I used to think the B stood for binary. And then I had an actual guy who actually knows that writes database code, like the actual code in the engine, and says, no, it stands for best. No, really, the B stands for best tree, not binary tree. I'm like, you know what, I'm not even gonna argue with you about it. So, I forget if I know. But, so, essentially the way it works is It'll take all the values and start dividing them. So let's say there's 10,000 rows of data and it's all alphabetic. So from, you know, Latin A to Latin Z. What it'll do is it'll take your records, find the middle. So you could have possibly more people in the A to N than there would be, say, from O to Z. So what it'll do is it'll find the middle part where you can divide the records evenly between them and it'll put say A to M on one side, N to Z on the other. It'll t then take that, divide it in two again, so A to G, H to M. Then it'll take that last set and divide it again in half. Um, it's a bit like the guessing game, you know, guess a number between one and ten. What's the first number you should always guess? Five. And then you'll be told either higher or lower. So if you're told lower, what should be the next number you guess? Three, because you're dividing it in half. Again, you get higher or lower. Somebody tells you higher or lower, 
again, you can divide in half. And at that point, you're down to choice of 50-50 chance. If it's lower, if it's higher, you found it. Because it'll be four. That's literally how a binary tree works. It takes the values, divides it in half, divides that in half, divides that in half. So that when you do a query, and if we can go to this slide over here, you'll see how it takes, right now in this database, we have, goes up to F, middle chunk is from H to P, the last chunk will be R to Z. And then it'll divide it that, you know, everything from A, B first, and then we'll have stuff that's D, and then stuff in F. It'll divide it again, so that when we need to go and find someone to go select star from, you know, whatever, where name is equal to flyers, it'll go, oh, it starts with F. Okay, so it's in this set. It'll look down the next set. Oh, it's an F. It'll look in this set, and then it'll know if it needs to go down further, like to FA versus FL. And then it'll reach the end point much faster than if it has to go, oh, is the name equal to flyers? No, it's aces. Is the name equal to flyers? No, Bombay. Is the name equal to flyers? No, it's Chattanooga. Is the name equal to flyers? No, it's fantastic. That's a table scan, whereas the index, it can, it'll do four jumps, and suddenly it'll know a block of area to search in. Then it'll scan through that block. So it'll say, you need to look at records 10,000 to 10,050. So it'll just go through those 50 records. And the syntax is pretty straightforward. It's create unique index, give it a name on, and then you give it the name of the table and the column that it applies to. Or you can do create unique or just regular create index. And it's the same instruction except the unique says there cannot not be duplicate values. So maybe your primary key would be user ID, but you might create a unique index on email because you don't want people to enter an email twice into this table. And the index will also be indexed. The column will be indexed for faster searches, but it'll be unique values. Therefore, it'll be a very efficient uh, one. Um, so unique indexes are used for primary keys, but like I said, it could apply to other unique keys, SIN numbers, email addresses, phone numbers, that kind of thing. Um, Non-unique indexes, zip codes, product categories, you know, various other things. It'll just help speed up the search. And the syntax is create index, give it a name on person. In this case, field is name. So that means we're going to index all the names in the person's table. So th there's a few catches when you create indexes. Man, these are all my slides. This is great. You can tell in my slides because you can see the footers all messed up. She didn't take the time to clean up the footers. <laughs> Shouldn't make fun of Sandra. Um, so create index, double index on person, age, comma, city. So that's going to create an index that indexes two columns. So the way it does is it literally creates uh, fingerprints of the combination of the two columns and indexes that. How does it actually do it on the inside? I have no idea. I'll be honest, I have no clue. There's some way smarter people than me that know how this works. Um, so that index would help with select star from person where age is 55 and the city is Seattle. But it will not help if it's just where the city is equal to Seattle. Because the index has two columns, it will only ever help in queries where both of those columns are included in the where clause. If there's only one of the two columns, the index is invalid, it doesn't match what you're looking for, therefore it won't help. And on the other hand, if I had an index that was just for the city, it would help with that query because the city is part of the clause, <coughs> therefore it would help in that case. Okay, so I'm going to add some caveats on indexes because that's literally where we're going to stop today is on this slide, which is going to make next week's lecture really short. Congratulations, short lecture next week. Um, there's a few catches with indexes. Catch number one, they take up room. <coughs> with everybody's computers nowadays, when disk space is measured in gigabytes, terabytes, you know, petabytes. We don't have petabyte hard drives yet, but you know, it's coming. 
Um, indexes still take up room. So for every index you create, it will occupy a certain amount of space. So if you create 10 indexes, it'll occupy 10 times as much space. It's possible with certain kinds of tables where the indexes actually occupy more room than the tables themselves. Not a good idea. And here's why. Since you always have your primary key, you always have at least one index, no matter what, because you should always have a primary key. Foreign keys are not indexed automatically. Should they be indexed? Sure shit it should be. Always index your foreign keys. I've had to fix somebody else's mess because the query, some queries at work were running really, really slow and we couldn't figure out why and I looked and he never indexed the foreign keys. The table only has, you know, 750,000 rows in it. Why do I need to index the foreign keys? Dude. Three, if you have a lot of indexes on a table, the query optimizer will sometimes get confused. It won't know which index to use. Therefore, you don't want to index every freaking column, and you don't want to index combinations of every column. You don't want to index the entire t all the columns because those won't necessarily always be used anyway, so you're just wasting space. So back to this slide where this combo right here matches age and city because it'll help with this, but it won't help with that. So somebody say, well, I'll get smart. I'll also create an index called um, single index on person, and they just put in city. That means suddenly this one will work. And now my example is I'm super simplifying what's happening, but I, you just need to roughly understand. Suddenly it'll, this query will run and there's one index that has both columns, one index has one column. It's gonna say, which one am I gonna use? Okay, example's pretty easy. We know there's an index with two columns in mesh, so I'll use that. So now suddenly we're gonna add a third column. And uh, I don't know, suburb equals something else, okay? Suddenly, the query optimizer will say, hey, I got a query that covers two columns, I got one query that covers one column, I got, you know, I got an index that does two, I got an index that does one, I got a, and then I don't have an index on the last one, which one am I gonna use? At that point, it's gonna take a best guess at which index to use, and it we may pick the single column one or the two column one, depending on where your parentheses are. So if you have too many indexes, the query optimizer will start getting confused because they'll have too many options to pick from and it may do some suboptimal choices. It'll always help, but it might not be the best choice. Uh, it's a bit like, um, you know, when you have three ways to solve a problem, there's, you know, the acceptable way, the good way, and the really good way, and you just give up and you just take the, you know, the good way instead of the really good way because you just don't know what to do anymore. It's the same thing. And indexes have one other little caveat. Every time you write to the database, it has to update the index. You guys don't really think about optimization or performance right now at this point in your burgeoning careers, let's say. So we're gonna update one row of data in the database. This table has six indexes because somebody went index crazy. We're gonna to write to this table. So we're gonna update the row of data in the table. <coughs> then we're gonna start updating every index that touches whatever it is that just changed. So let's say four indexes out of the six indexes use that column that you just updated. Somebody just got married, their last name just changed. And suddenly, not only do you need to write once to write their name to the database, <coughs> you need to write four more times. So every single write operation is actually five write operations. It's actually more than that. It is for every single write operation, there'll be one operation for the actual write, and then there's two operations for every index. One, it pulls, it reads the index from the disk. It updates the index and writes it back to the disk. So for every action, for every time you update a row that is affecting an index, it will be one action for writing the row, plus two IO operations for every index that's affected. So suddenly you went from updating one, one write operation to suddenly maybe 10, 12 write operations. That adds overhead, it slows things down. Indexes do get 
less than optimal because you know they're not really maintained all that well so then you have to rebuild indexes every once in a while that adds overhead because it's got to do table scans and rebuild all the indexes so this wasn't in the slides but this is you know kind of important information about the pitfalls of indexes as great as they are you shouldn't go crazy you create them for what is needed you look at the code that's accessing the database, you look at what is used regularly in the where clause, and then you index. So you have a customer record. You may never search by street address, but you can possibly always search by postal code. You might always search by phone number. You might search by email address. So you'd probably want to index those three columns so that you could search quickly on those and you can ignore the rest. Okay, which brings us to the end of today. There was a lot of information today. Um, it's a good thing my Camtasia didn't crash. I was during my lecture yesterday, Camtasia crashed. And I didn't realize it, and I lost 10 minutes of my lecture, just went Pfft. But it lasted, I've been keeping, that's why I keep seeing it looking at the camera, because there's a light, so I can tell it's still running. Um, the last couple of labs are up <coughs> and visible. Um, you now have everything you need to finish the assignment as of today. Literally everything you need. Um, those of you that have started doing labs 7, 8, and 9 have already experienced that 7 is not that bad, 8 is not that bad. I don't know, has anybody tried on 9 yet? Because I don't, you didn't have the lecture for the joins, so pretty sure nobody's really tried it yet unless they already had some SQL history. You know, I got Kyle over here going, yeah, I've tried it. Um, yeah, that's okay. Lab 9 is hard. I will say it now. It's not long. But it's challenging, but it's just like lab seven and eight where it builds up. So you start out with something simple and you just keep adding to it over and over and over again until you reach the other side. Assignment two must be demoed. You must be in a group. Otherwise you can't submit. Again, email both Alem and me and we'll get the group set up. Outside of that, see you guys later. <laughs>